I've been dumb with my money. I have. And you know what? It feels good to say it. To get it out in the open means that I don't have to feel guilty about my dirty little secrets. Now, it doesn't mean I don't feel stupid for the mistakes I've made. I do. But I don't have to feel ashamed and keep them hidden. Now, in this video, I'm going to share with you three of the dumbest things I've ever done with money. And if you watch all the way to the end of the video, I'll show you the one devastating misstep I narrowly avoided. So you'll be safe from it too. What's up everyone? My name is Matt Matheson. I'm a personal finance writer, teacher, and school principal. I'm also the founder of Family Money School. And this channel is all about helping kids and the parents who love them become money rock stars. A recent survey of 5,200 people revealed that 47% have money worries that have caused them emotional stress. What's more, 40% have had worries so severe they've lost sleep over them. And the last troubling revelation, only about half are talking about these money concerns with others. I mean, evidently, I'm not the only one having secret worries and guilt about handling money. In this day and age where we're encouraged to talk more openly about topics such as racism, mental health, and sexual abuse, it's troubling that money is still such a taboo topic, and that there is a level of privacy around our finances not seen in many areas of our lives. Now, I'm not saying we need to be open books and bear our financial souls to the world, but it'll be very difficult to improve our financial situations, you know, be that our bottom line or the feelings of stress and anxiety we experience about money if we don't start talking about our money more openly. So, in the spirit of bringing what was once in the darkness into the light, let me reveal to you the top three dumb things I've done with money and the one I narrowly avoided. Okay, first up, I bought Iraqi dinar. Now, this may be the one that I'm the most ashamed of. A few years back, before my wife had gently encouraged, run, Forrest, run. encouraged me to build my financial literacy skills, I heard from a friend of a friend about a great investment opportunity, investing in foreign currency, in this case, Iraqi dinar. Now, the general idea was that in the wake of the instability after the Iraq war, the dinar was incredibly cheap because US dollars were the currency being used. The thinking went that once the situation on the ground stabilized and the Americans pulled out and the Iraqis began to run the country again, the dinar would be reestablished as the national currency and its price would shoot way up. Essentially, the dinar was on sale and I should buy dinar with my money and wait for it to explode in value. It was easy money. So I did. Now, it was hard to find a financial institution that would actually let me buy dinar, but I did find one reputable bank that let me do it. Fortunately, I only invested a few hundred dollars and I didn't borrow to invest. Otherwise, it could have been a lot worse because I have to tell you, I'm still waiting for it to skyrocket in value. Now, the thing I regret the most, I got my parents to invest in this as well. D-U-M-B, ooh, bad son. So here's what I learned. Anytime a friend of a friend comes to you with an amazing investment opportunity, run. Run, Forrest, run. Run like you're Forrest Gump. Don't look back and don't stop until you can't hear their voices calling to you about amazing value and historical examples of how this works or guaranteed returns. Nothing is guaranteed, and there is no such thing as easy money. Nothing. If you ever hear me tell you otherwise, please kick me in the butt. No, figuratively, please. Now, today I only invest in things I understand that don't promise getting rich quick. If it seems too good to be true, it is. That includes the latest hard to understand, get rich quick investment, crypto. Now, I'm not saying crypto is bad. It may not be. I'm simply saying I don't understand it well enough to invest in it. And I'm certainly not investing in anything that promises the type of astronomical short-term returns things like Bitcoin, Cardano, and Ethereum entice investors with. Instead, I invest in index funds. Yes, boring old index funds. I'll talk more about them later, but the basic premise is owning a tiny bit of every stock on a particular stock market, like the S&P 500 or the TSX in Canada. 
Now, these don't promise that you'll get rich quick. Actually, just the opposite. They promise that over time, if you consistently invest, you will get rich, but slowly. Now, there is an incredible amount of research behind why these are the best options for the average investor. Unlike the research behind Iraqi Dinar, you know, my friend's buddy who runs a very successful business. Now, the second dumb money mistake I made was that I didn't crush the subscribe button. No, of course, I'm just kidding. No one would make that mistake. Of course, you've already crushed the subscribe button. No, in all seriousness, the second dumb money mistake I made was that I bought a new car. Here's how the dumb went down. I went into a car dealership looking for new wheels. Now the car I had, a four-year-old Mazda Protégé, which I loved, was getting a bit old in my mind and I wanted an upgrade. I had a good job, it was in a good place money-wise, and I felt like I deserved it. Plus, when I went in, I got a smoking deal. They gave me 0% financing over five years, threw in a set of winter tires and a car starter, and it came with a great warranty, meaning that any repairs would be free for several years. And the kicker? The monthly payment was only $559. Oh, that number seared into my mind. But at the time, it was something I thought I could easily afford. I was hooked. I signed on the dotted line and drove off the lot with an asset that was instantly worth around 10% less than I just paid. Brilliant. So what did I learn? Well, if I told you I wanted you to invest in a product that would instantly lose 10% of what you paid for it, then in five years you could sell it for about 40% of what you originally paid. Would you invest with me? Of course not. But that's the math behind the change in value for a new vehicle. For my car, I paid around $30,000 for it, meaning that after five years, my car was worth $12,000. That's a loss of $18,000. Oh, ouch, it still hurts. But wait, you might say, I didn't have to pay for any repairs because the car was under warranty. Well, true. Sort of. There were some things that were under warranty, but the things that happened as a result of my own stupidity or wear and tear, those weren't. Plus, I mean, do you really think that I had $18,000 worth of repairs on a brand new car? I mean, let me help you answer that. No. Car companies aren't stupid, but they count on us to be. They know if we pay $30,000 for a new car, even with 0% financing, I mean, just a gimmick to get us to pony up the cash because they still get their money in the end, they are going to come out the big winners after five years. And now with them extending the term of loans to seven years and beyond, the lower monthly payments make these deals seem even more attractive. But don't be fooled. Car payments are financial anchors. Few things have felt as good as when I paid off my car loan and sold that stupid car. We now buy cars that are around two to three years old or so, with low mileage that have been taken care of by their owners. Now, these cars have already had the bulk of depreciation happen. I mean, cars lose 15 to 25% of their value in each of the first four years, meaning that a car that is three years old may be close to 50% cheaper than the original cost. That's just too good a savings to pass up. Plus, many of these cars still have great warranty left. Okay, we're only one dumb money mistake away from the misstep I narrowly avoided. But before we get there, I have to tell you about how I bought a cruise for my parents. Over the phone. With my credit card. From a telemarketer. Now this is probably the pinnacle of my financial stupidity. The culmination of my financial ignorance, dim-wittedness, and naivety. I was at home one day when I received the phone call. You know, would I be interested in purchasing a Caribbean cruise at a discounted price? I mean, immediately, being the good son I am, my parents popped into my mind. Their 30th wedding anniversary was coming up, and this would be the perfect gift. Now, as all rational brain functions ceased, I began to talk to the nice lady on the other end of the phone about the details, doing my necessary due diligence. Now, I asked about the particulars of the deal, what the refund policy was, and I was assured that if I changed my mind, I could receive a full refund. It sounded like a good deal to me, risk-free in fact, at least that's what my prefrontal cortex was telling me. All I needed to do to seal the deal was give her my credit card information over the phone. I repeat, 
All I needed to do was give this complete stranger who had cold called me the digital information to be able to charge my credit card an ungodly sum of money for a trip I had not researched with a company I knew nothing about and had not investigated at all. Huh, sounded good to me. I gave her my credit card information, hung up, and immediately knew I had made a massive mistake. To make a long and actually really interesting story short, I ended up doing a little research and realizing that this company had scammed a lot of people out of money. Due to the fact that I wasn't alone, I was able to check out some chat groups and find out what I should do to pursue a refund. After countless early morning phone calls to the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, in which I pestered, bothered, annoyed, and informed them that I would be their worst nightmare and would not leave them alone until I got my money back, I received a refund check in the mail. I rushed to the bank, deposited the check before they could change their mind, and put in the rearview mirror one of my dumbest financial mistakes. Now, I learned several things from this experience. One. Don't give your financial information out to people you don't know. I mean, it sounds obvious to me now, but at the time, it wasn't. Second thing I learned was that persistence coupled with knowledge can get amazing results. After I'd been scammed, I did a ton of research into how to get my money back. The recommendations I found online totally gave me confidence that there were steps I could take to get justice. Armed with this knowledge, I was the most persistent and well-informed consumer the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Affairs had ever dealt with. Now, I've used this tactic of knowledge plus relentless pursuit equals amazing results in other areas of my life as well. And it has proven to be a powerful combination. Just don't take no for an answer. Simply refuse. Be persistent and get results. Now. What do I do differently today? I don't buy cruises from telemarketers. I don't know, over the phone. Okay, we finally arrived at the money mistake I avoided by the skin of my teeth. What was it? I almost became house poor. Now, when my wife and I got engaged, we were looking for a home to buy that was ours. I had a condo, but we wanted to start our life in a place that was new for both of us. We looked at buying a place that was a few years old that we could do a few minor upgrades to, but I'm not super handy at all, so we began to look at new homes and even at building. Now, during our search, we came upon a house that really caught my eye. It was on a quiet little cul-de-sac, and it was awesome. It was larger than we needed at the time, in fact, much larger, but I figured we could grow into it. It was expensive though, way over our budget, but after crunching the numbers and getting the insanely high mortgage pre-approval from the bank, we thought we could make it work. It would be tight. We'd have to cut back on a few things. No holidays, new clothes, dinners out, no gifts, cable or lattes, no furniture, electricity, heat or showers. Okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly for effect, but it would have been really tight. Basically, we wouldn't have been able to have any fun. We'd have a huge house and no life. Ironically, we were both feeling that this wasn't a good financial decision, but neither of us said anything until one night at dinner, we both expressed that we weren't feeling good about it. We talked about living in a smaller home, maybe just a bit outside of our town, where we would be able to get more house for our money. And that's just what we did. And I'm so glad. It would have sucked and been really cold in that unheated house. Now, this experience gave me a front row seat to the constant pressure we all face to inflate our lifestyle. We're constantly bombarded with messages about how we need more and bigger and faster and nicer things. We all, myself included, need to learn how to be more content. This is hard, it's really hard, but it's worth learning. Otherwise, we'll never be content, and that's not a life that I want. Now, I also learned that a house, while we do spend a lot of time there, is not the be-all, end-all. I value the things I own, but I value experiences much more. I want to travel with my family to be able to spend money on gifts and to go out and do fun things, both now and in the future. And I don't want to put myself in a financial stranglehold that makes that impossible. Now, having been married for over 10 years, Dion and I talk about money much more openly than we did before we were married. I mean, this is natural in some ways, but I do know that a lot of couples don't talk much about their money. This is quite literally the silent killer of your financial future, and sometimes your relationship. 
Communication is so key to financial success. I mean, without it, secret spending habits can take place. I mean, resentments can build up and goals go unspoken and therefore not achieved. So those are the most stupid things I've done with money. As Dave Ramsey says, I have a PhD in D-U-M-B. But I know I can't be the only one who's made some stupid moves with my finances. You know, what are some money mistakes that you've made? Drop a comment below as a way to bring your financial skeletons out of the closet. And with all our dumb money mistakes now out in the open, in the next video, I'll show you nine of the most common ways that poor people are dumb with money and how you can avoid them. I'll see you there.